in the entrepreneurs you work with, you know, there are ill-defined requirements, ill-defined, um, you know, I have a particular take on it, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, especially when there's like not an established path in the geographies and the technologies, you know, um, how do you how do you guide them? Like, what are the touchstones? What do you look for? You know, how do you filter out things that are just completely wacko, unrealistic, or like, and yeah, yeah. Um, and things that are, you know, why do them now? What is it? What are the touchstones you look for? Um, one, I'm looking for energy. So this was back when I was a VC, because you know, VCs basically we just all we do is meet people all day long. Um, and what we're filtering is sort of this intuition of does this person have what it takes to actually get it done, right? Because there's, a, it's sort of like the difference between, it's sort of like um, what they say about politicians and presidents and presidential candidates, you know, or, or politicians and, and candidates. There's one skill set and profile to be a successful candidate. There's a different one to be a successful legislator, right? Because being a politician, being a legislator is a grind. You got to, you got to get in there and you got to, you got to talk to people. You got to negotiate and compromise and write a bill. And it's just effing work. Being a candidate is being telegenic and being well-spoken and being likable. And does someone want to have a beer with you and relatable? Those skills don't necessarily translate to being a good legislator. Yeah. And what I find is, um, so that's why founders, you tend to have a team, you know, the salesperson, the front person who's the charismatic, ooh, you know, I'd follow this person anywhere. And then the other person who's the grind, who tends to be the techie, who just, you know, going to be heads down and just build the damn thing. Um, and so uh, what I'm looking for um, is in the team that there is that the person who can communicate and the person who can actually execute it. It's rare that you can find it in one person. And and it's a lot. It's it's really hard to be a solopreneur because there's so much to do that you can get overwhelmed um, in terms of where you direct your energy. Because there's like, where do I start? Where do I start? Right. And so I actually a lot of the coaching that I do and mentoring is helping people triage and just say, OK, let's let me let's untangle this and just, say, just start here and just say, you know, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, because they're kind of going like, it's sort of like they're running around and their compass is spinning. They don't know which direction to go in to get started. And the point is you just get started. Just start walking in a direction and you go until you hit a wall. And then when you hit the wall, you either go left or you go right. And you go, oh, okay, I gotta go left now. And then you go, okay, then I go right. Nah. And, and and it's it's this wayfinding that, that I have found when you're doing something that's utterly and completely new. If it's something that already exists, then you just do that playbook. You know, if you're launching a bakery, you don't have to reinvent how to run a bakery, right. right? Go, yeah, I go, go work for a bakery and learn everything there is to learn about how to run a bakery, you, you know, and then launch your own bakery. So um, I am a big fan of people actually going in and having a well-rounded corporate experience so that way they know what it looks like to run something when it's resourced, right? And then you could say, oh, okay, because you don't have to wear the HR hat and the, and the coding hat and the sales and marketing hat. You can, you can actually interact with people who specialize in that. So that way, when you do hire and build your team, you know what to look for because you've actually worked with professionals, right? right? If you haven't worked with professionals, you don't know how to hire for them. You don't know how to select for them. And worse, you don't respect what they can do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's and, yeah, it's certainly a mindset of some engineers I see in Silicon Valley where, where they don't necessarily respect the value of marketing and coming up with a crisp message and fine tuning language and all that. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you think about kind of in the space, what are you seeing uh, in terms of the, on the investor side of things in, in peace innovation? Um, are you seeing something similar to the sea change I'm seeing where more and more the distinction, distinction between sort of impact investors uh, looking for high impact, maybe money losing investments and kind of traditional VC and, and investors is sort of getting grayer and grayer. Are you seeing that trend yourself or is that just a I selection bias been... on my part? I haven't, to be honest, I haven't been focused on VCs, so I haven't been in contact with that community in a while. 
um, when I was working with more like multinational finance companies uh, and also in Europe, because Mark and I spend so much time in Europe, the sensibility is much different there. They really care about ESG investing. Mm. They actually care about SDGs um, here in the United States, not so much. But that said, in January, February, um, who was it? Um, there were two significant um, investment houses that said that they we're going to look at everything through the lens of ESG. This was pre-pandemic. I'm trying to remember who it was now. Oh, I think BlackRock um, was one of them. BlackRock was one of them. Yes, BlackRock was one of them. And I think Goldman was the other. Um, because we were looking at this decade and saying, okay, you know, basically time's running out. So everything that you've been deferring like kids the homework is due you know we got to do the climate change we got to do the stuff you've been procrastinating you cannot procrastinate anymore you have to do this shift it has to happen and it's gonna happen so the question is do you want to guide it and have a soft landing and a good transition or do you want to take the hit what's interesting to me about the pandemic is the pandemic has accelerated the future into the present because some of the the, the social um, collapse issues associated with climate change can also be triggered by a pandemic. And so in terms of migration, we're looking at IDPs now in our conversation with our peace and engineering folks, uh, internally displaced people because of the pandemic as people start getting evicted in September. Uh, what are you gonna do with these homeless populations? They're not the traditional homeless, they're new homeless. Um, it's the same issues that you're gonna have with um, climate refugees, they're going to move. They need to be, like I said earlier, whatever the condition is, people still need to be fed, clothed, educated. They still need health care, even in a pandemic, even in a hotter planet. So the companies that will succeed will be the ones who can deliver those products and services under those conditions in a profitable way, in a profitable, sustainable way. If you can't do it, you won't survive. You know, if you can't provide these products and services with a, a, a zero or negative carbon footprint, there will be some entrepreneur who will come along and do it at a negative or zero carbon footprint, because that will be the feature that matters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not about, you know, because all things being equal, if you can do that better than someone else, boom, guess what? You're now you've been disintermediated. Yeah. Um, so that's what I see. And I think that there's smart money who that's realizing, yeah. So there's gonna be all sorts of stranded assets from the fossil fuel economy. It's like, what are you gonna do with all these um, internal combustion engine cars yeah. when we switch over to electric? It's a problem because it's a problem, it's a pain point, which means there's an entrepreneurial opportunity there as well. I, I love that reframing because I think um, part of our thesis has been in the small, right, where we're, you know, as I said, the sort of the layering of technologies has a similar problem, which is that um, if you don't think about your projects and your investments in a holistic way, you're going to miss out, not just economically, but also on the long-term social impact. You know, it'll be, it'll be a blind spot. I think um, it's funny, we've arrived at a similar thesis from a, from a different technological angle, right, where there's like hidden, um, hidden benefits to making the right choices for social impact that has the cascading effect of you know, positive environmental and, and, um, and, and fiscal impact. I, I think that's a hard, unfortunately, a complicated story to tell and make simple, but I think um, yeah. that's part of what's exciting about this domain that, that you're helping define, right? Which is that like, the, the narrative is there. It's just you have to kind of get all the noise out of it and kind of help entrepreneurs and sort of this new wave of possibilities, you know, materialize those new stories. I, um, and I love the idea that, um, you know, it's there's a, sort of a the inevitability that you kind of, uh, you know, project. I, I love that idea because I think that's probably what it takes to create a compelling story, right? There has to be an, you know, uh, inevitable sort of ending to this if you don't, if you don't sort of make these, you know, very concrete um, um, things happen. Um, yeah, huh. we have um, one of our PIN members is a futures forecaster, and uh, it's been fascinating working with her because she wants to work with us and, you know, 
our co-op students um, and other PIN members to do peaceful futures forecasting. And certainly in popular literature, when we go back to the, the, the notion of narrative, and the, the interesting thing about narrative, um, as Lee says, is that you, you know, it's hard to tell people facts because we have these cognitive filters and biases that say, I reject your facts. Because if I accept the facts, that means I have to do something about it. Like if my behavior or the way I operate in the world is, in, is not congruent with the facts, something's got to change, right? So I either declare that those facts are wrong or I have to change myself. And the energy and effort to change myself is so great that it's easier to reject the facts. So boom, done. On the other hand, he says that if you present it in the form of a story, we don't get those defenses up because it's just a story. And it engages a different part of our brain where we can imagine what that might be like. And then we can play around in that possibility space, in that design space. What would the world look like if it operated this way? What would it look like if it was dystopian? What would it look like if it was utopian? You know, all of these future possibles, we can entertain them and not get that cognitive dissonance. We won't reject them. It's just, we're just, because we're just fooling around. It's just a story. Yeah. And so that's where the power is. Because if we can begin to imagine it, then our brains can like toy around with it. And then it doesn't become such a foreign idea. We don't reject it. And then after a while, we go like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that story. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see how can that happen. And then subconsciously what happens is we start walking toward that future. Um, and you can really certainly see that with like Star Trek in the 1960s because the Star Trek, it was, it was so many parables were in that show because it was really talking about what's going on civil rights and, and so on, but it was cloaked in this future setting. So you could talk about these difficult issues without triggering people because it was in this future setting. And, and you could look at the technologies and you can look at how people are interacting and say like, okay, you know, we don't, we don't go to war and we have a prime directive. This is how we're going to show up. We're trying to be good to other species. We're trying to, it's a very peaceful world. Um, and you look at the, the gadgets and it inspired a whole generation of engineers to say, I want to make that thing. And I remember when the Motorola uh, flip phone came out in the nineties, it was like all the cool, all the cool guy kids, all the cool kids, all the VCs had one because they had it on their belt. Like, it was like a communicator. It's like, right. Because that's what it, it was evocative of that optimistic future. Um, and now like for, you know, people like my son, he's 20, the young adult literature has all been dystopian. And so, so imagine the programming that everyone's getting of dystopian futures, dystopian futures. And so then you go, well, this is, I've seen this movie, this is the way it's gonna be. So I, I had this Buddhist thing about, um, you have to have practice really good mental hygiene of the thoughts that you let in your head. Yeah. Um, especially difficult, I mean, I think, you know, um, Like living in Oakland, for example, you know, I, I live just a few blocks away from um, downtown Oakland, where some of the protests happened, you know, over the last several weeks and months, and it's it um, it can be quite um, disheartening, you know, to see that much strife that you know that has gone unaddressed, you know, over over decades and kind of boil over, right? And um, it's very easy to let those negative sort of you know, features kind of <laughs> embed your, embed themselves in your mind, you know, and uh, um, especially when you're trying to, you know, in, in the space I'm in where we're trying to build new things and you know, we're generally trying to be optimistic about these things. Um, I think I do find that I have to be extra disciplined about, as you said, the thoughts that I let into my head uh, in, in terms of like just unconsciously almost having some of them, some of that negativity creep in. Uh, I mean, I like to think that I'm an optimistic realist or a realistic optimist. I don't know. I, I don't, <laughs> I want to, I want to know what is, right? I don't want to deny whatever's happening. Right. And I also want to hold open the possibility that it can radically change. Um, and it's really interesting being in the behavior design, behavior change world, 
where people say, well, it's so hard for people to change, but in fact, people change all the time. Yeah. It's just that they don't notice it. They don't notice it. I mean, if we think about how much our world has changed in the last 12 years because of this device, yeah, radical. It's like, boom, in a decade. You know, just how we interact with each other, how we work, how everything, just with the introduction of that device, radical change. So it's not like people sat down, woke up one morning, it's like, you know what I really want is a device that I can hold that's going to radically change everything. And all I do is stare at a screen for 10 hours. No one said like, hell yes to that, right? But here we are. Um, yeah. So there are things that can happen in the environment that can force change, either involuntary, like the pandemic, or it can be voluntary. It could be aspirational. It could be something that in, in, introduced into the environment that says, oh, that allows me, all of a sudden it gives me the superpower or this ability to become this person that I always wanted to be or to do this thing I always wanted to do. And I think part of how we create the future that we want is to make it aspirational, to make it so attractive that people go, I'm naturally going to gravitate toward that. I actually didn't even notice when I gave up the old thing because you know, I don't miss my old Nokia phone. <laughs> you know, I, I, I put it in a drawer and holy smokes, I haven't gotten it out in 10 years, <laughs> you know, because I use this thing all the time. And that's how it happens. Yeah. I think that's how it can happen. That, that triggered a thought in my head. You know, um, the go, going back to the fact that, you know, I envy the fact that uh, Mark and you get exposed to so many different kinds of entrepreneurs across the planet, you know, uh, uh, I, I wonder, you know, the thought that occurred to me is, yes, I, I completely agree that part of starting is just to start, right? Just overcome the inertia and just do, right? Uh, what other big barriers do you see, N not ignoring Silicon Valley, like what other things do you think these international entrepreneurs need? Um, to kind of be more successful? What are you seeing that's missing? Kind of, uh, you know, uh, in addition to just being equipped with some of the basic tools of just starting and kind of, you know, barreling um, ahead. Right, so certainly you need a community. It's really lonely, as you know, to be an entrepreneur. So one of the things that we're doing with this, this PIN bootcamp um, is creating a community of practice and, and a community of peers so you can share resources and inspiration and and motivation and 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 everything so we give them all sorts of tips and guides and resources and how to's and so on and and there's homework it's like okay have you done your homework yet because everyone needs an accountability partner right it doesn't matter if you're going to the gym <laughs> or trying yep. to do a startup <laughs> you need someone who's going to say so raj did you yeah. get your pitch deck done and you're going like well no it's been two yeah. two months and it's like co-founders are critical <laughs> right right so you need you need an accountability partner um, that's super important. The other thing that I found that I learned over the years, like when I did Astia, which was the tech incubator for women that I launched in 1999, was I could not, I could not guarantee the success of any of those startups and for those women. What I could do is says, I can put a spotlight on you. I can make people aware that you exist and what you're doing, and I will promote the hell out of you. Right. I will get you on the covers of magazines, which I did. And this will be a great place to be from. Those mm -hmm. things are in the locus of my control. I can't guarantee that you're going to get funding. I can get you coached and prepared and make your pitch deck and all that. We can go through the mechanics of it. It's almost like being an elite athlete and your coach and you're saying, OK, you got to go and 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 do your drills. You know, you got to, if, if we got to sit there and do like a hundred dunks, you know, I was like, boom, boom, into the, you know, all right, we're going to, we're going to do all this. Right. You will get really, and I will help you with your form. And then when you play, you'll have that muscle memory and you'll know what to do when, you know, the ball is coming to you. You'll know how to act and increase your probability of success. I cannot guarantee your success. So for entrepreneurs, I think having that that community and people who can coach them and, and get them through the drills, right? Because it, it is a lot of practice and say, and by the way, you pr it probably won't work. But that doesn't, just because you lost the game doesn't mean that you're not a great athlete because you're going to get fit. You're going to, 
it, there's always another season, there's always another team. And, and I'm interested in the vector of that person's career. So even if this, piece, this discrete piece tech thing doesn't work, there's gonna be another piece tech company who's gonna look for someone like you who has that body of experience or you might go and become an investor and become an impact investor. And you're gonna be a, an extraordinary impact investor because you were on the other side of the table. You understood what the issues were on the ground, what the barriers were. And so you can now, you now know what that person needs because you were that person, right? So I'm very interested in building ecosystems. And, and, and doing that is you have, to, you have to create and develop that human capital. You know, Mark is really into financial capital. We talk about capital all the time. And what, what, is, what is resource and what is money and, 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 and what are currencies? And certainly with Chris Bennett, our game designer, we talk about currencies all the time. Human capital is a form of currency. How do we, how do we increase that investment? How do we make that human capital grow? And that's one of the powerful things about Silicon Valley is that it's been really good, amazing, in investing in its human capital. We all work for Silicon Valley Inc. It's just that, you know, our email addresses change every two years. <laughs> but collectively, we're in the business of innovation. Collectively, we're in the business of getting things out into the world very quickly. And we get lots of practice at that. You know, a lot of chances at that to do it. Um, in other parts of the world, people don't get the reps. So they're not as good at it. And so they only get one chance at bat. And if they don't hit a home run, it's like, sorry, you don't get to play again. I mean, that here, that's ridiculous because everybody has failure on the resume. Everybody has a failed startup, a failed venture, a failed project. <laughs> and if you don't, you haven't been trying hard enough. <laughs> so I think part of it is the, the different mindset here as well. Um, because we just say that it's like, oh, you just got more experience. Now you know what doesn't work. And, and, you, and hopefully you'll reflect and you have some wisdom and say, okay, the next time I do it, I know that I need to do this differently and I need to acquire this skill or I need to have someone who has that skill. Like I'm an engineer, I failed because I didn't know how to tell my story. So for my next startup, I'm gonna get a really strong branding marketing person who can help me write those three sentences that people understand, yeah. right? I wonder, um, do, you, do you also feel that in terms of competencies, when you talk to people outside Silicon Valley, are they coming to you with all that tooling and all the skills reasonably well developed across the board, or do you see this general focus on different skill sets? Is or you know, are where do people where do you know where, where are you seeing new entrepreneurs emerge? What conditions are causing you know are helping entrepreneurs emerge as a mindset? Is it primarily cultural, or are there other dynamics in in, in place? I, th I think what's happened is that, you know, for the last ooh, almost 20 years now, there's been this whole social entrepreneurship effort. Um, certainly, I mean, I was a social entrepreneur at Stanford in 2004 when they had their digital vision fellows program for social entrepreneurs. Um, so it's, it's had, you know, it's interesting because things kind of, these things kind of go into 20 year life cycles. It takes about 20 years for something to emerge into like more of the public consciousness. Like design thinking has been around for quarter century as we know it, IDEO and so on. And I have people go like, we just discovered design thinking. And they go, it's a quarter century old, but that's okay. Because it takes that long for something to move through into the mainstream. And so I think this stuff is beginning to move into the mainstream. And, and it's because of, you know, God knows my failed social entrepreneurship efforts. You know, that was like the 2000s, like, it's just not working. Um, and it's in a lot of it is just timing because so there are other people who have to go there and till the soil and tell those stories and, and, and socialize and, and do that groundwork. Um, it's the, all that pioneer marketing. And then it's the nth iteration of that idea that actually takes off. It, I don't think it's as foreign anymore. And through TED Talks and other event, um, uh, communications channels, people have more awareness. And it's just a matter of the convergence of the, the, this generation of entrepreneurs 
the technology, the dropping cost of developing things, and then you get into the sweet spot where all of a sudden it's possible. Also, um, in terms of the public, consumers, now they care about this stuff in a way they didn't 20 years ago. Right. And I think that matters too. But I've been talking too much, Raj. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is enlightening. No, thank you. Uh... I didn't mean to sort of grill you. I, 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 no. This this line of thinking has been sort of um, su super important to us, you know. And and we've kind of um, we're trying to be extra careful this time around. You know, speaking of attempts and failures in entrepreneurship, around sort of the the collateral impact, <laughs> for lack of a better term, on kind of the work we're doing. That's why I was curious on you know part of part of why we explicitly chose a diverse set of projects across the planet, not, not just the sort of provincial and, hey, let's do Northern California projects, right? Was because I think we very consciously wanted to see and be challenged by some of the dynamics of other countries, other, you know, other perspectives. And that has been really helpful. And part of what kind of weighs heavily on my mind in the space we're in is, um, are we doing this the right time, right? Are, are the other, factors we cannot control ready in those domains, right? In, in, in the Kenya example, right? Our, you know, we can model everything, you know, to heart's content, but if the other, you know, political and social factors aren't lined up to make those things successful, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, so this is really fascinating because I think, as you said, it's interesting your, your, your thesis about the 20 year life cycle, that's been, uh, that's a really good way of thinking about this, right? Like. Um, there's probably a spring loaded <laughs> um, demand, you know, across, uh, across these countries, across these demographics, you know, for this kind of opportunity to kind of be part of these kind of high social impact efforts um, where people want to sort of help the communities directly, you know, the communities that they're from directly, as opposed to sort of external sort of forces coming in and somehow upending their, yeah. their communities um, there's um also like entrepreneurship is a subculture it's a global subculture and uh it is a very strong subculture among youth especially again because of these devices it changed you know nobody was really talking about agile in 2000 we're, we're right. still into waterfall design and deep specs and la la la. And then, you know, I remember when this came out and I was at Rico Innovation, and we were like, what can you do with it? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, at first it was the novelty, like, ooh, you could touch it and use your finger and all that. And they go, but what can you, what can you code on it? Because it was so tiny, right? right? And then BJ Fogg did his course, his Facebook course, where they opened up the Facebook platform and they go, what can you do with it? I can send a poke. O okay. <laughs> so what? And so it was just breaking that paradigm of what coding was like, which was big and heavy and a gazillion features. And it comes on five CD ROMs and it comes in a big box and it weighs five pounds, right? Microsoft office in the nineties and saying it's something small, you download it and it does just one thing. It's like, what? Yeah. So it, if you can remember back what the apps were like on the iPhone yeah. and people are going like, oh, what does it do? It's a timer. Does it do anything else? No, it's just a timer. <laughs> it's like, ooh, okay. Um, and so, so now you have a whole generation of people who think about how do I make something small and how do I produce it in, over a weekend? So then you can get a lot of revs and, 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 and create a little lifestyle business just with apps. Right, so there's a whole ecosystem of people who are have lifestyle businesses just as app developers for Android and, and Apple, and that's all over the world, right? And so then you have that base, and then you can build on that, and then build on that. So I think that in the next five years, there's going to be really, really interesting stuff coming out, because that generation now is at that point. Uh, my nephew, I did a case study of him 10 years ago when he was a teenager explaining what this next generation of the workforce was going to look like. I go, he's 15, he has a garage band. Let me show you what he did with $200 in 365 days. Mm -hmm. And it was like, 
And I go, when he comes into the workforce, he will already know SEO. I mean, we, it wasn't, we didn't even have those terms back then. I go, he knows how to market himself. He knows how to sell digital content. He has 80,000 fans on his MySpace page. You know, someone, in, he knows how to barter and trade. And he's learned all this organically because he was passionate as a musician. Now he has his own digital creative company. He doesn't, you know, he went to college and got a degree, but how he runs his business was everything he learned from the, from the age of 15. Right. Right. Yeah. And so what's interesting about the entrepreneurs that we're seeing is they know how to use social media. They know how to influence. They know how to get followers. They know how to communicate. You look at the phenomenon of TikTok and you go, great. You know how to do that. Now we just have to put a back end right. of, of what is the change that you want to create in the world. Right. Right. Because you have an audience. I mean, as you know, as an entrepreneur, the hardest thing to do is get an audience. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's funny. Um, one, one, given your experience with this, um, with the diversity of sort of, you know, perspectives on, you know, and entrepreneurs, I wonder, you know, one thing I'm, and this could be because I come from a world of engineering uh, and a certain amount of formality that I had to sort of let go of to become a, an entrepreneur. But mm -hmm. I, I often wonder if, the value of the sort of everyone can code, uh, you know, ethos, right? I think that's that's been kind of you know taken some root in Silicon Valley. But um, are you seeing that sort of ethos sort of truly spreading? I, you know, you, you'd mentioned that you know people are creating lifestyle businesses across across the planet, you know, just just on code. Um, that's really fascinating, right? Because what what percentage of the population is that? Is it you know? Um, is that repeatable across the population? Is it, you know, how, not, how, how do not, you think about that phenomenon? Um, it's funny because sort of like you usually see this in like in STEM programs for like communities of color, like, okay, your way out of the hood is you're going to become a coder, right? And it's like, most people don't have the neuro profile to be a coder. <laughs> they just don't. Um, but that doesn't mean that they can't be a creator of some sort. And so I, I, I do, I do think that, this notion that the future is that everyone's going to be a programmer is very reductionist. Cause it's like, man, I would agree. Really? Um, I think that there are, I'm really interested in the sort of like the, um, the return to homespun artisanal um, products and services, because that's answering um, an unspoken need. Uh, but there is a there is an and so then the digital tools are in service of those artisanal products because again instagram influencers uh, imagery um you know uh, uh uh youtube videos it's you know how to you know um produce your own honey or whatever all these things are so those tools enable these artisanal um entrepreneurial activities and that i think is really really cool well on that front i you know i do find um shopify's broader strategy against um positioning them against amazon and the marketplace amazon marketplace really interesting have you have you seen people build the viable businesses um on those kinds of platforms where they're you know they're using Kind of the leverage of, of an access of platforms like Shopify to get get a larger audience, get get reach, and get to sustainable. Um, I haven't studied Shopify in depth. Um, I've been looking at platforms like Etsy, right? Yeah. Which where people again, it it there you know these marketplaces are interesting because it's all about discovery. Um, uh, Fiverr. Uh, for gig economy people. So you want to find a video editor or someone to transcribe something or, I mean, and, and these people are all over the world, right? Because you can tell based on some of the pricing, you go like, really? $5 an hour to edit, video edit? Ah, oh, they're in Lebanon, right? Um, but and in which case, the, 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 the super skill that gives you access to all that is being able to speak English. You know, uh, some of Mark's early virtual assistants because he's had a series of virtual assistants for the better part of a decade now. I think one of them, was she in the Philippines? I'm not sure. 
And so um, I find these platforms to be especially empowering for women. And especially in countries where, um, in conservative countries where women can't leave their home, they can do virtual assistant work from the privacy of their home. Right. So that that's created huge employment opportunities for for that that category of women. And and again, the only superpower that you you need your skill and English. And so English is a powerful technology. <laughs> powerful thinking, technology. And are we doing anything to to wedge that in, or or, or is there like I know that for example you know, I was born in India, but we moved away when I was very young. Um, but most people I know in India, you know, extended family, they speak, you know, English very well. Um, because that's part of the curriculum and all that from an early age. But I wonder, you know, is there, are there other forces making that even more viable? And just, just to give people more access, is that something that's happening? Are you seeing that happen more and more? Um... I haven't looked at it specifically for that in terms of a trend. It's just been something that's been going on for a while, for a long time. Um, certainly um, 15 years ago, when I was doing deep into the social entrepreneurship, we were looking at that and predicting that, and the technology wasn't quite there. But there was, um, again, the ICT investment based on the World Bank and, and so on right. to get the infrastructure in into the villages, into these communities to allow that to happen again 20 year horizon right you put it in there it's expensive it's clunky there's some pioneers who are really on the bleeding edge and after all it becomes the norm and so now i i just see all this getting very much into the mainstream so you don't even have to explain a marketplace now because people get it right it's like yeah. amazon yeah. etsy fiverr thumbtack yeah yeah got it right it, you, you don't have to you don't have to there's so many existence proofs of buyers and sellers, Airbnb, and the securitization of stuff that when you say, oh, I'm going to securitize something, people go, yeah, I got it, right? Because we've seen it, we've seen it be successful. We know, we understand the mechanics of it. We know how do you algorithmically, how do you match people? Uh, what are the trust mechanisms? What are the payment mechanisms? All the technical details have been worked out. And from a behavioral standpoint, this is key it's not weird for people to do that anymore, hmm. right? The first time you do it, the hard part, I mean, once you get all the mechanics down technically, is the behavioral part. And that's where people, and I would see this as, when as a venture capitalist, I didn't have the vocabulary for it at the time. But it's like, yeah, technically it all works. Why aren't people doing it? It's because it was weird. It was a foreign behavior. It's like, you want right. me to do what? On where? Right. With who? It's like, <laughs> right? right? Now it's not, it's not a big deal. I remember I was an early adopter of LinkedIn. I was back when they used to rank who the most connected people were. I was like 125th on the list of like 300 people. It was kind of funky. Um, and I would tell you, you got to get on LinkedIn. And, 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 and I would tell the women VCs I knew, they're like, I'm not going to get on LinkedIn. And it's like, no, no, you got to get on LinkedIn. It's like, I'm not going to do it because it was weird. It was weird to put your resume online for other people to see. And right. I would talk to like Hispanic communities and Hispanic professionals and they're, I'm not going to put my, or they put their name is like, you got to put your photo. I'm not going to put my photo on. And then they put like <laughs> their name and, you know, start date, present company. And that's it. It's like, hmm. got anything else? It's like, no, that's all I'm going to put. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put down what I do. That's weird. <laughs> right. <laughs> 20 yeah. years later, it's, the first yeah. thing that you do when you meet someone is you you look them up on LinkedIn and say, who are you? Right. It is your calling card, I guess, that URL. Yeah. Um, last question. I, I, I know I, <laughs> I know we've gone over time. You know, one obvious thing that comes up, you know, when we talk about entities like Fiverr and Shopify, Thumbtack, is the difficulty of international commerce, you know, because even for these digital goods, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with people in in the Netherlands, in Netherlands Spain, you know, um, um, Uruguay, <laughs> uh, the Czech Republic, and 
in fact, right now I'm working with an engineer from Costa, who, from Costa Rica. And, you know, um, one thing that I've found quite difficult is the, the commercial transaction, you know, getting people paid in an easy way. Are you seeing anybody making like, what, what needs to happen there? Like for, for that aspect of it, or is it already a solved problem? Uh, um, I don't think it's a solved problem yet. I mean, I use TransferWise, okay. which, which is wonderful um, because if I'm going to wire money overseas or pay someone overseas, it's easy peasy, super, super easy. Yeah. Um, before that would be like, how do it is like here's my iban number and i'm an american i'm stupid american I go, what, the, what what's an iban number uh and i'd look and i go like i'm not sure how to and i hate and sorry no offense i don't like paypal because there were all those years where you know you'd get these phishing all that stuff with paypal i just went like oh it's just too much trouble <laughs> I just don't yeah. want to deal with it it didn't it didn't feel trustworthy it felt like very like people were always looking to hack your paypal account so i just like oh, i just don't want to deal with it um, TransferWise is very easy. Um, digital nomads use TransferWise quite a bit to move money around because it's fast. It's super, 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 super fast and cheap. Um, and they actually solved the problem I was trying to solve 20 years ago. So yay for them. <laughs> um, hey, like you said, it's a 20 year life cycle to get, to get well, to the mainstream consciousness. Especially, especially when you're dealing with money because it's so heavily regulated. And so you have things like the US Patriot Act and know your customer and all these things. So money, any kind of money transfer or money payment is not for the faint of heart. You actually need to have people who are expert in all the regulatory issues. And it's really slow. At least it was when I was doing it. Um, it may be better now, but I, I'm not current on it. Um. You know, one of the one of the startling things. Uh, this is before the quarantine. I was in on University Avenue in Palo Alto, and I went to the um, Walgreens, the, the pharmacy, and I was shocked to see that they had a Western Union oh, yeah. uh, terminal, and there were two people standing in line to transfer money. And mm -hmm. and I, you know, it's one of those things that until you see it you, and you see activity on it, you just completely ignore. And I, and I completely blank on the fact that that is a thing where people still, on mass go to these terminals in the physical world, put in cash, pay up, you know, pay a percentage to get it transferred to their families, you know, and uh, that's, um, it's talking yeah. how primitive these things still are. Um, oh yeah, I was, I was, I was looking to disintermediate Western Union in 2003. Ah, yeah. Okay. So Western Union is interesting because again, people are, are habituated to use it. Right. And especially when you're talking about the informal economy and people who are unbanked. Um, and, and let's go back to the beginning of our conversation about what, how do technologies perpetuate bias or how do technologies perpetuate exclusion? When you go into digital payments, it perpetuates uh, financial exclusion because there's a whole swath of society that is unbanked for a variety of different reasons. And so that means they cannot participate in the digital economy. That means they cannot participate in um, those discounted economies of scale. Yes, it's cheaper to buy something on Amazon. I don't have a way to pay digitally. That means I cannot take advantage of those lower prices. I have to pay more because I have to pay cash. Right. Or I am limited in my choices because I can only pay cash. And that is, um, again, when we talk about elite projection or elite privilege, uh, we, we just assume that everyone everyone has an, an account and yeah. everyone has a card and so it's no big deal and isn't it going to be it's going to be awesome. The more we move in that direction, um, the the harder that line is between the people who operate in the cash economy because they don't have a choice and everybody else. Right. And so it perpetuates a certain type of economic and financial exclusion. But if you haven't lived that, you have no idea because it's invisible to you. Again, the, the, the Western Union terminal, you don't notice until you go, oh, look, there are two people there. Otherwise, it just sort of, it just blends into the background. Yeah. And do, do, do you see people make it like concrete moves? Um, you know, again, I go on the whole rabbit hole around, um, you know, payday lending and kind of what happens in, in communities that yeah. I lived in, you know, ages ago. Um, 
in South Carolina where payday lending is it's so extraordinary common. extractive and predatory yeah um, mm -hmm. there the the entrepreneurship that I've seen in around that has been actually Hispanic entrepreneurs and Hispanic entrepreneurs because they get the problem right because the again in in Hispanic communities uh, African American communities you know minorities those are the fun you, you don't have a Wells Fargo bank on the corner mm -hmm. you've got a payday lending place or a check cashing place and so I've seen uh, and and those companies actually have been venture funded um james gutierrez is a serial entrepreneur in the space uh where he has provided um lending products for uh hispanic uh low-income hispanic consumers so he's i think he's on his second company in the space in the financial space oh um, what was the what was the company do you, do you remember um let me look it up really quick mr james gutierrez i knew james when he did his first startup because it was called magic beanstalk back in 1999 aura financial a-u-r-a oh. and prior to that he did opportune o-p-o-r-t-u-n which does affordable loan services and programs oh interesting i'll definitely yeah look. yeah so he was the co-founder of opportune and then now he's doing aura it was originally, um, Opportune was originally known as Progreso Financiera. And then there were a couple of others in terms of remittances. There was Zoom as an XOOM uh, in the late 2000s, like 2007, 2008, and a couple of other ones looking at, you know, the informal economy and the unbanked and remittances. Huh. I think, look, I mean, I, I the, 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 the thinking around that is, is fascinating, right? Because I wonder if if the economic sort of, for lack of a better term, the economic dynamics around payday lending can be kind of really change and still create profitable businesses. You know, I I don't know if you, you know, from what I've read, they seem, and what I've experienced, you know, in the younger days, they seem obviously extractive, but they've been sort of around for such a long time. There must be mm -hmm. some other forces that are kind of keeping them you know, in the spaces there are. Well, it's interesting when you get into it because it's very predatory. And for um, a lot of banks, that's where they make the <clears throat> biggest margins. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so, there's that. So, 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 so the opportunity is to reimagine banks, right. to fundamentally reimagine banks. Um, Bruce Cahan at Stanford has done a lot of work in this area of reimagining, you know, what does a moral bank look like? If and from, and, from and I, I think I think you could do it. I think you could do it. It's just again, telling the story and making it compelling and then having that existence proof. Yeah.